Thank you very much, very much, Jonak, uh, that you are here today uh, with us, and um, uh, it's yours. <laughs> All right, thanks for having me. All right, let's see. Okay, well, uh, my name is Jonah. I'd like to thank Adam and Scholastic for having me. Um, some of you I met earlier today at the workshop. Uh, so there's going to be about six or seven slides that you've probably seen before, but other than that, it's all going to be new information. Um, let's see where to start. I would say that this uh, lecture, if you want to call it a lecture, um, which I think it just the format would deem it a lecture. Uh, it's kind of personal. It's just sort of about me as a person. I have a hard time distinguishing from my professional life and my personal life, as most creative people probably do. Uh, so this is just going to kind of walk you through. Um, well, it's kind of strange. I guess I turned 40 in September, and I guess it's 2019, and I started my studio in 2009. So this is sort of this strange, like, 10-year retrospective or something, but it starts like when I was born, so. All right, so this is weird thing. I tried to figure out a way to describe it with text, but it didn't, something about the parentheses is sort of strange. So I was born in 1979, and my dad is Japanese, my mom's American. This is important later a little bit. Uh, that's me right there, and then that's my dad, and that's my mom, and my grandparents, and my aunt and uncle. I lived in Japan for about two years, and then my parents divorced, and I moved to America. Uh, this is the house that we lived in. My room was up there. I have a younger brother. He lived there, we had basketball hoop, the whole thing. Uh, it's a very sort of typical suburban existence. Um, I lived with my mom. My dad was in Japan the whole time. So I spent a long time poring over his uh, portf uh, portfolios. He's an architect. He studied uh, in, in Japan and then went on to study at Yale where he met my mom in the late 60s. Uh, so in his absence, I mean, we have a relationship, but I spent a lot of time as a kid just sort of poring over this portfolio that was bound and it's actually featured uh, prominently in the uh, exhibition tomorrow night. So this kind of just got to me. I don't know, part of it was just not seeing my dad that much. So I just like kind of had this idea of what he was like and you know, what it was like to be an architect and just again, looked at this stuff over and over again. Um, so at a very young age, I was sort of, I didn't know what it meant to be a designer or an architect or an artist, but I just knew that I wanted to be like him. Uh, that manifested itself in like playing with Legos and blocks and things like that. And I do remember distinctly my uncle on my mom's side, my uncle Bob, he was, at some point I was playing with Legos on the floor and he was like, you should go to art school. And that sort of stuck in my head. So this is my high school, this is in Connecticut. So it's like three hours north by car from New York City. And again, it was just very suburban. Um, and I felt like I got pretty lucky, I think in high school. It's a big public high school and there was probably I'm guessing maybe a thousand students. And we were fortunate that the sports teams were really crappy. You know, the football team sucked, lacrosse, all of that. And we ended up having a really good art program and music program. So whereas some students, you know, when they're sort of figuring themselves out and doing creative things when you're like 15 and they have a really stereotypical hard time in high school, it was pretty easy for me and my friends. I played cello in the orchestra and was playing in, you know, kind of punk and ska bands and, you know, taking art classes. So going back to my uncle, uh, part of that conversation, or when he was, I mean, I was like 10 or something, he was, it was not so much a conversation, he was kind of just telling me what to do. But he was like, you should go to RISD, it's a really great school, blah, blah, blah. Um, RISD is the Rhode Island School of Design and it's in Providence, Rhode Island, which is like two hours east of where I grew up. And it's kind of a quintessential, you know, New England college town. Lots of bricks. Um, when I went to apply there, like my portfolio visually was very strong, but I was a really bad student, so my academics like were just not very good. Uh, they really scared me. They said, oh, your portfolio looks great, but we're going to re-average all of your GPA and we're going to take out music and art and gym and all the stuff that you can get really good grades in easily. And I didn't think I was going to get in, and for whatever reason, uh, they admitted me, and that was 1998. 
Um, when I went into school, I was kind of torn. I was thinking about like maybe being an illustrator. I wanted to be like an architect like my dad, but I didn't really have that sort of discipline or the sort of, I don't know what it was. I just, I just felt like I wasn't smart enough or something. Um, I really liked architecture. The, my problem with it was that I liked to build things. I just couldn't really wrap my head around just drawing stuff for the next, whatever, 40 or 50 years and having other people build it. And I know there are exceptions to that. You can do a lot of different things or you know, do whatever you want, really. But at the time, I just wanted to get my hands dirty. The other side of that is that you know, in the US is a private school and I had to take out a lot of student loans. So I was like, well, I would have a hard time I don't know, well that actually made me want to do a more professional degree like architecture. I also wanted to make stuff and be a sculptor, but with all the student loan debt, I decided that it was a little bit irresponsible for me to you know, be buried under a mountain of debt and just come out with like a fine arts degree. Fortunately for me, in 1999, they started a furniture design program, and I felt like it was like the perfect middle ground, I guess, in between architecture and sculpture. The scale of things was, you know, I could kind of relate to it, you know, I could, you know, make things, you know, like, uh, like sculpture, but you, there was also a certain amount of craft and technical education that, you know, was enticing about architecture. So I did my undergraduate degree at RISD, majoring in furniture design. This is where I lived in college. It's on Meeting Street, my friend's studio, and that's me and my roommate Jack. Very typical thing, we lived in that house with 12 people. And here's just a couple of things that I did when I was a student. Um, it was, the program there at the time, it was very craft oriented. Uh, a lot of the teachers, they're all American, but they all came out of like the 70s, 80s, and 90s craft studio movement, or you know, craft studio furniture in the United States. And there was a big emphasis on cutting dovetails by hand and hand veneering panels and you know making your own laminations for bent laminations and that was great although at the time I was very self-conscious about it because I had friends in other schools that were starting to get into like you know computer modeling and laser cutting and all of this stuff so at I don't know it was good and bad in hindsight I really feel like that education that was rooted in craft is totally priceless I feel like there should be more of an emphasis on it these days, especially now that I spend like 90% of my time staring at a computer screen. Uh, so this is from my junior year maybe, and this is from my senior year. We had a whole semester about veneering things. So I bought all this veneer and did it all by hand and uh, taught myself to slip cast porcelain for this lamp on the right. This is something I did sophomore year. This is bench, all this stuff is firewood or something, I'm not really sure where it is. Um, I graduated in 2002, and this is this kind of weird section of, I mean, it's not weird, it's my life, you know, but it's like uh, this interim period. So from like 2002 until 2009, I just played in bands. It was always like my first love was just playing music, whether it was cello or just playing in bands. So I moved out to Portland, Oregon on the West Coast and then found myself on the East Coast again in 2003. And I spent the next like five years just doing a version of this. I played like, I don't know, in a few different bands, you know, we'd tour wherever, North America or Canada, go to Europe. And, you know, it was like this basically, hang out with a bunch of smelly guys in a van that looked like that, like a 15 passenger van, or in that case, it was like a little Astro van. And I think I have a picture of that somewhere. Um, I love playing music, it's a huge part of my life and it's a really big foil for the design work. In some ways my design work, it's really inspiring but there's, you know, the creative moment, like that eureka moment, is very short I feel like and very fleeting with design. I sort of have this moment of inspiration and then you spend a lot of the time sort of butting your head against it and trying to work through some sort of problem or these finer points, you know, which are all interesting, but in a completely different way. You know, playing music, you're much more present and much more in the moment for a longer period of time. That eureka moment usually lasts the whole time that you're playing music with, I mean, some people play solo, but when I was playing with bands, it was just this collaborative thing that would last, whatever, an hour, an hour and a half, something like that. 
Uh, so that part of the day was great when you're on tour, but the rest of it was just like, you know, waiting for things to happen. So, you know, I don't know where this is. This is from 2006. I guess we were going to New York to play. And, you know, you could see the load in is at 2 p.m. So that's when you have to arrive and unload all your stuff. And then you have to wait for like eight hours and like, you know, just any, pick a shitty bar and you just sit there for eight hours. You know, you try not to drink too much before you have to play. Then you play and it's amazing for 45 minutes or an hour. And then you have to just wait for three hours until the show is over, until you're, you know, whatever, ready to pack up. You know, usually sleep on somebody's floor, you wake up, you drive for six hours and you do this whole thing again. And for a while, that hour of, you know, playing was totally worth it, but it got old fast. You know, for me, I was a little bit like ADD or something, or I needed more, just the waiting kind of killed me. Um, so yeah, that sort of lost its appeal, probably eh, maybe 2007. So uh, studying furniture, was helpful and you know I mean obviously now it's helpful looking back on what I do but there was also this chunk of time where I was just doing whatever so I wasn't designing furniture I was hanging drywall doing plumbing like just odd jobs so I'd go on tour for two months and then I'd come home and whatever just get paid cash under the table to do this kind of thing and I was also like building sets so I worked with this guy who had a uh, you had like a scene building shop and we did a lot of things like that. I don't even know what this is for. This is something we made, but like, you know, I remember having to like paint all these like fake bricks and that's what you did for like three weeks and just sitting there just like, ugh, you know, making each one look a little bit different, like with like five different color washes and you're just like, and you're just doing the whole thing. It was like, so there was a lot of that. And then that's kind of like also when I just like hit rock bottom with tour, I was just like, get me out of this van you know, waking up and you're just like, where am I? You're like on the floor and you're just like, I hate my life. So this is like probably 2008, 2009. And this is, I'm like here. But anyway, so we did this tour. We were opening for this, for this band. Uh, and you can see there's five of us. That's Drew and then that's me. And that's Laura and Benji and Amy. There are five of us playing and this is like, this is 2009, so I was about to turn 30, and this is in New York at like Webster Hall. We were, this is not our audience. We were opening for a much larger band, so we would play with them every night. And my mom drove down from New York, and this is her, this is my mom. And we were, you know, she was so excited. She was like, oh, Jonah, there's so many people here. This is great, you're doing so well. I'm so proud of you, you must be making so much money. And I was like, yeah, we made 250 bucks. And she's like, oh, well, that's okay. You know, 250 bucks, you know, you play a show. And I was like, no, that's 250 bucks for the whole band. I was like, so I got paid $50. And you're like in New York and it's like, you get a cheeseburger and two beers and you're just like already that's gone. So that was like this moment. She didn't really give me any pressure, but I just remember having that feeling. I was like, I don't know if I want to do this right now. So um, I was right around when I turned 30. So. In 2009, I was like, I'm gonna, you know, be a furniture designer. I was like, I'm gonna figure it out. So this kind of gets into this whole just my professional life where I'm just, even today, like day to day, I'm still just like feeling it out. I, as you can tell, I never had like an internship. I never worked in a design studio. I don't have a graduate degree. And, you know, I don't like, didn't have like a mentor or anything. So I just sort of had to like make this all up on my own. And like I said, even today I have like very, you know, I have like real insecurities about like if I'm doing a good job or like my process or, you know, I did this workshop today about the design process and I get as much out of going through that exercise and leading the workshop as everybody that was in the workshop because I'm just like, oh yeah, there's like a way to do this. Um, so this was 2009, this is the actual thing, but I just found a, I went online and Googled like design competition in New York City. And there's something called the International Contemporary Furniture Fair in New York that happens every May and they have a small section of it that's devoted to young designers. And you send them a rendering or, or you're supposed to send them the actual thing. But I sent them a rendering that was actually pretty good, but it looked like this and they chose it. But then they were like, oh, is it real or is it not? And then I had to make this thing in like 
four days. I just like stayed up all night and like, you know, I mean the top part, I had a friend turn on this crazy open-ended lathe, but yeah, I turned all these other parts and made it and sent them a picture of it unfinished and they decided to admit me. Then again, I was kind of figuring it out. I was just me at this point and I was like using the, the guy that I was building those, you know, doing in the, the set shop. I was using his shop on the nights and weekends when I wasn't building, you know, painting bricks or whatever. So I decided to, you know, I was like, I need a name. So I read somewhere, you know, Atelier something. So I figured that I would just be Atelier Takagi, you know, it's this kind of workshop lab thing and my last name. And I started, this is where it got weird. I was like, oh, I have to like make believe that I'm like more than one person. So I started talking in the royal we and I had like all these email accounts for like different fake people. Like I had like, you know, Alicia and she was like the press person and I had like the engineering email and still to this day I get some of these emails sent to me and I can't, I have to just be like, oh, fuck, you know, it's a little weird. Uh, so I was Atelier Takagi, so I drove up there in my Subaru and made, I had made three of these tables, put them out on this thing, sat there for like five or six days. Uh, if you've ever been to one of the big fairs, like, I don't know, Cologne or uh, uh, Milan or something, I mean, I, ICFF is literally like 20th or a 21, 25th of Milan or something. So. I don't know, nothing happened. I did this, it was great. I met a lot of people and actually people that I'm, that became important professionally much later on. I met a lot of people, I had a great time, but nothing came of it. And then I went back home and just was doing odd jobs. Uh, this is just a random picture of food from Germany, but it was like, I was like, I don't have many pictures on my computer of like stuff that happened, you know, from that long ago. And this is like on my phone, I guess. So I was looking through and then I came back and I was like, I need another opportunity like this. I didn't know anybody. So I just found something similar at the IMM Cologne, or Cologne in Germany every January. They have a fair and they have something similar to that ICFF studio but it's like 10 times as big. Instead of seven designers, there's maybe 70 designers. And, you know, I was just like, I'll make some work and go over there. Um, I was sweeping the floor a lot. So this is, I'll go through a few projects here. I probably have six or seven that I'll go through, but, and they all relate to different times in my life. So this is a project. I spent a lot of time sweeping uh, the floor at the shop. So I decided to make a series of tables that used that threaded wood sort of connection to make some flat pack furniture. So this is, again, this is, actually this is 2010. So it's pretty straightforward, you know, the connection, it's all just one material, like the, you know, the fastener is the ornament, you know, I threaded it a little bit farther down the leg, so even when, the, when they were threaded in there, you could see, you know, this obvious sort of connection. There are a bunch of tops, the legs are all interchangeable. Um, so I put those in a box. And this is a mock-up of a lamp that I was also sort of making. And I used, on the first one, I used like a saucepan and, you know, just a light bulb taped to the inside. Um, and I eventually, at this point, I was sort of teaching myself a little bit how to do like 3D modeling. So I did have a few pieces machined and this is the final lamp. Uh, and you know, the machining all happened here. It's just this connection with three different pieces that all come together. Uh, and they terminate in this kind of funny joint thing. So that right there was just a prototype. I think I made three of them and this is just spray painted. I took the pictures myself and went to Germany. So that's in Germany in 2010. Uh, I asked a friend to give me a few. He's a sculptor and he just carves, tra carves trash out of wood. Uh, so he gave me a few things and I just sat there. There is an actual person named Alicia. Uh, so she came with me and helped me out because I didn't, you know, just standing there all day was like pretty gnarly. So that happened. Uh, this was good for me. Uh, this really made a big difference going there. At the time in 2010, the scene was a little bit different. It was like this moment when there was like a renewed interest in American design. Um, if you're familiar with designers like Lindsay Adelman or Jason Miller, David Weeks, they're all kind of had this moment and like, and they're, they're about five to 10 years older than me, but they all kind of had this moment and addressed right at the sort of beginning of the decade. And I don't know, I sort of got swept up in that a little bit sort of 
on the tail end of things. So I was the only American designer there. There was probably 70 designers from all over Europe and Asia. So I was a bit of an anomaly and that got my foot in the door with you know, different people, a lot of uh, design writers from the US that you know, they just kind of stumble through these trade fairs and they were like, whoa, you're American, what are you doing here? You know, and it got, it started a conversation and it led to, again, a lot of, you know, good things in the future. This is the, another thing I found on my computer. So coming off of that show, one of the designers that I met was the editor-in-chief at Surface Magazine, Dan Rubenstein, and he, you know, I met, he was one of the guys that I met in Germany. He was like, what are you doing here? You're whatever. So um, he wanted to hear more about my story. It was also kind of interesting because all of these designers in the US were all based in New York and I was based in Washington DC. So that had this other sort of weird editorial angle. Uh, he arranged for, you know, this, this piece to run and this woman was writing it who later became a good friend of mine. Her name is Monica Kemsarov. And I had never met her before, but she went on to start the blog Sight Unseen, if you're familiar with it. And she's a very close friend of mine now. They wanted to take these photos in New York, and I was based in Washington, D.C. So I had been to this store once called Matter. It's in Broom Street. And I just picked up the phone, and I cold called the store and was like, hey, I went to a party like two years ago at your store. You know, I got this guy from this magazine that wants to write a piece about me. I have some work. You know, can I come up there and can they take pictures of me in your store? So I dragged my stuff up there. They took some pictures and that led to my first sort of licensing arrangement. Uh, so these are a couple things. All of this kind of came from uh, that show in Germany form. It's a German magazine. There's, you know, some Norwegian magazines covered it. Um, and then you know, I went home and was building more sets, so more of this stuff. So I still was making zero money doing this. Um, just to, I took out a couple slides here. But anyway, that light down there, I think that's a rendering, but you know, this one up here, it eventually, that company that I, or the store that I went up there <laughs> to take the pictures in Matter, they ended up licensing it and they still produce it to this day. So that was my first licensed product. I'll go kind of quick through these. I think there's a bunch of projects in here. Uh, this is, you know, when I got back to DC, still wasn't making any money. So I was just like, I'll make some more lights. Uh, I was into these bulb protectors. So started sketching on that, you know, just doing just tons of iterations like we talked about in the workshop. Um, eventually modeled them and because my background is just in making things, I find it much more effective just to get my hands dirty as early in the process as I can. So from this, I just don't, jumped straight to welding this. So, you know, sitting there on the bandsaw. I mean, it's amazing how much you can do with like a bandsaw, some plywood and a drill press. But I just, you know, made this jig and they had this really crappy MIG welder. So I just was like, I'm gonna make this lamp. So this is the prototype I made and I showed it in New York City in 2011 uh, at a show that was organized by the woman that ran that Surface magazine piece. So Monica Kemsarov, at that point, she had founded Sight Unseen and they hosted a series of events during New York Design Week uh, featuring designers from all over and she wanted to exhibit this light. That was, again, very fortuitous. I just can't emphasize enough how just like all of this stuff is so weirdly interconnected that when I have to go back and think back on it, it's, it's just amazing that I'm just here to begin with, just these chance meetings, you know? And I think that's just a testament, or that just speaks to, uh, well, more mainly luck. I mean, there, as I mentioned before, there's people that are much more talented than I am, that language in obscurity. There's people that are much less talented that are extremely successful. But I think, you know, as a designer, you just kind of try not to be, you just have to be a person of your word and be like genuine and not an asshole. You don't know who you're gonna meet and like where that's gonna lead. Uh, so this is a testament to that, the woman that ran that thing. And then, so she put this light in there and then uh, the company Roland Hill decided to license it. And to date, this is frustratingly, it's like one of the first things I designed, it's like the most successful. So they sell tons of these lamps and they've been selling them since 2012. I mean, it's kind of a complicated relationship with it because I'm like, oh man, what did I do? You know, what was I doing in 2011 or 2012 where I made this lamp and now it just sells and sells, you know, 10 years later. I mean, it, don't get me wrong, it's not 
making me rich, but it's, I'm like constantly like, what, is, what did I do? What happened there? And it's also, I mean, it's been knocked off. You can get, you know, knock off Chinese copies of these. So they make them in a couple of sizes and a bunch of different finishes. Um, I was like, man, lighting's doing really well. So I, this is quickly, I spent a lot of time on, you know, sets. So I decided to design a light that was loosely based on, uh, you know, this sort of diffused glow from when this light hits this reflector. It seems very like of the time or something. It feels very much 2012, but I needed to make a bunch of work because I decided to do a third young designers competition. And this was in Milan at uh, Satellite in, I guess, 2012. Uh, so I, again, like Germany, I was still Atelier Takagi. I had some random stuff that I made, you know, still working out of this guy's shop. Went over there and, I mean, yeah, again, like all these things sort of snowball. So it's like you see the same people that you saw in Germany and the same woman that wrote this thing about you. So, I mean, it wasn't so tangible, I guess, what happened after this show, but I swore that this was like the last one of these shows that I was ever gonna do. It's really exhausting. You have to be there six, seven hours a day. They're not free. I mean, the one in the US was free, but I mean, they get progressively more expensive in Milan. I don't know what it costs, you know, maybe $4,000 to exhibit here and you're paying out of pocket. You have to get your work there. You have to produce the work. So I swore this off. Um, in 2012. Moving on, this is the, what's the Barcelona, what is this? Barcelona Pavilion, yeah. Um, I'm just into buildings and architecture. Uh, so I wanted to make a table that incorporated some of these elements. My rendering skills were not very good. They're still not very good, but this is like, what I was working with in 2013. So the store Matter, they who licensed that light, they tried to get into like small batch production, you know, and it's, it's a very difficult thing to do well. And I think their strength, they've grown a lot, but I think at this point they were a little bit down on, you know, trying to do this kind of small, not really small additions, but like, you know, just sort of limited batch production and, they asked me to design a table, you know, that was like a one-off table for design week in 2013, I think. So I just was picking elements that I saw in buildings that I admire, whether it's this kind of truss work or, you know, this, uh, you know, I-beams and things like that and just messing with scale and trying to create a composition that was interesting to me. Again, this is in that same set place. I was just in there at night and on the weekend trying not to get hurt because no one was around. It was like in the middle of the night and you're just in this huge empty warehouse and welding and cutting things. It's like playing with fire. So this is me making this. And here's the finished piece. Um, it's called Range Life. It was named after the pavement song that I really like because they make a lot of references to some sort of prairie kind of vibe and as much as it was inspired by uh, the Barcelona Pavilion is, you know, I don't know, Frank Lloyd Wright, prairie style, range life, it all seemed to make sense. Um, yeah, and this table, this, I don't know, it's not terribly big. I can't give it to you in metric system, but it's like, <laughs> it's like this big by this big by this big. Um, so at this point, like I was, I think right around here, I stopped working, like having a day job per se. Uh, I was still kind of doing odd jobs, like if somebody wanted a railing built for their restaurant, I would do that. Or if somebody wanted something done, I would do that. But I stopped going to this uh, set building place every day. Um, and that had to do, I just reached a certain point, I guess, where people sort of knew who I was. It still wasn't the most lucrative thing, being a designer. But at this point, this is 2012 and the textile company Quadrat, they, I don't know if they were doing these types of exhibitions before 2012, but in 2012 they were relaunching this kind of famous wool, woven wool fabric called Hollingdahl. And they asked, I don't know how it was structured, but I think there was curators for different regions, Europe and the Americas and Asia and Africa, I don't know, wherever. And I think these curators, they picked a handful of designers to get proposals from. And I sent them this 
I mean, not this thing here, but um, I was just drawing these sort of tent structures. Uh, these are some renderings. I had gotten a little bit better at renderings by this point, but um, these are just some sort of iterations that I was working with. Um, this kind of day bed with some elements of, you know, sort of referencing camping stuff and nomadic furniture. I mean, it went so far I said some desk, but eventually I kind of settled on the typology of a day bed. I thought it was, I don't know, it was just the scale of it seemed right or something. This is pretty much what I ended up with in terms of the scale. Uh, they supplied all the fabric. Uh, the exhibition was in Milan. I think I'm getting the dates right. I think it's 2013. Maybe I might, it might have been 2012. But the exhibition was in April during the Salone in Milan. And, you know, they supplied all the fabric as much as you wanted. And there was a small production budget. So, but obviously the production budget wasn't enough. So I did all the woodwork myself. Uh, it sort of collapses, so there's these small, I don't know where they are now, but uh, they were, this was, there were some breaks here and they sort of sleeved together. And then I worked with an upholsterer outside of Washington, D.C. to do all of the, you know, the fabric work and webbing and things like that. So going back, originally, you know, I had this, this is not completely accurate. The fabric went and wrapped around the top and the top bar was removable. And this was also removable here and there was a pipe pocket that went across. So this thing was designed to be like drum tight, you know, just super clean. And I went so far as to like make this really intense like illustrator vector, step-by-step -step Helvetica, Ikea, like bullshit directions so that they would not screw it up. And then I sent it to them and they put, they like didn't follow it at all. So it's all loose, you know, like this pipe pocket here, this wood was supposed to go through there and that was supposed to be wrapped around there. And I, I this is like the only photo I have of it. And I just have to live with myself knowing that this is not right. I mean, this is the high resolution photo. Uh, here it is after I went in during the exhibition, you know, I had to go in there and it was like sweating and people were drinking cocktails and I had to fix it on the spot. Uh, and this is kind of, I wish I had a better photo of it. Okay, so, yeah, I think it's 2012. So this is me at my prom, and that's my friend Dan on the right, and that's Veronica and Alex Book. Dan's like my oldest childhood friend. We grew up in Connecticut together. He got a business degree uh, from a really good business school in the U.S. and was looking for something to do. He's not like your average, like, quant jock, like business econ person. He's kind of, he's like a drummer and just, you know, he wants to do something good and, you know, not, I don't know, whatever that means, but he wanted to just make something real, didn't want to just, I don't know, I don't know what business people do. So he, he was, at first he was like, let's, you know, I want to help you manage your studio. And then I was like, well, maybe we can just try to do something maybe a little bit more ambitious. Um, and we decided to launch a brand called Field, and this is in 2012. Uh, the idea uh, was that we were going to work with designers that I admire or have known. And, you know, I mean, in the best case, they're designers where you see something that they did and you're like, man, I wish I did that. Or I was thinking about the same thing and they did it better. So it was that sort of thing where we were like, I want to work with people, like friends and people I admire. So we started this brand and it's still going on, but uh, it was sort of founded with the idea that we were going to manufacture everything in the U.S., which there's, I don't know, it sounds good on paper, but it proved to be a little bit problematic. Uh, we, he, you know, he went to business school, so he did all this kind of focus. He had all this access to all these like business school, like online tools and stuff when he got out of school. So he did all these like strange focus groups with, I don't even know who these people were, but we, I don't know, maybe friends or some family or something, but we kind of did a little bit of research just about how to position this brand. And we thought, you know, being made in the U.S. was important. And also we wanted to tailor the brand towards men. These are some generalizations that I'm going to make here. But um, typically guys aren't, you know, out buying like home accessories and things like that. Like your average sort of middle of the road guy, you know. And we found that, you know, just men in general that, you know, they, they don't, they have a problem buying 
things that are marketed towards women, but women are much more open-minded and they don't really care. Again, these are very broad generalizations. But we figure we would just sort of go with this very masculine idea for field and everybody would be into it. So um, we, these are some mood boards. So Johnny Cash, you have Shaker Dwelling here, Marlene Dietrich and some Dieter Rams and some other sort of masculine, oaky looking things. We worked with a company in New York to do the branding and we ended up with you know, this whole brand deck. I'll quickly walk you through some of the products. Uh, we worked with designers from all over. This is a friend in London, Oscar Diaz. He designed this bottle opener for us. It's in stainless steel. Uh, this has been produced in two different factories in the U.S. Um, it's investment cast, so they make a wax tree and then uh, put the ceramic shell on it and then put stainless steel into it and then it's electro polished and then laser engraved. Uh, this is a product that we are currently looking to source overseas because it proved uh, problematic to have it done in the U.S. Uh, some candle openers, ah, candle holders, uh, some bookends that were machined out of granite um, by some Australian designers, Daniel Emma, and this is a friend in Lausanne. He's uh, went to ACAL and he's currently kind of teaching their on and off uh, Thomas Kral. He designed these measuring tools that are currently made in Taiwan now, which is really great because they're much nicer than the ones that were made in the US. Here's a desktop organizer that I designed and then also a magnifier by Daniel and Emma in Adelaide, Australia. Uh, in addition to you know, the launch of the company, in our first year we hosted an exhibition. It was a travel themed exhibition in New York during Design Week and this was May of 2013 and we asked friends and collaborators to create uh, objects for the show and it was everything from you know this crazy canoe that my friend Colgate built to this uh, bike from Belenki Bike Works. We had people that were doing graphics. Adam and Okolo did some work for the project. Um, you know, it was, I felt like it was very successful. We had a great time with this event and subsequently we haven't really done that many events. It proved to be um, a lot of work and logistically it was really tough to get all of this work and shipped and everything. So yeah, that was 2013. So 2014, I designed this. I'll, I'm going to go through some of this quick, actually. Uh, this is basically I was commissioned by a, an Italian company and they wanted me to design a coat hook. So I was just really into this nail stuck in the wall and whoops, and designed a basically a, cylind a cylindrical form that looks like it's kind of penetrating the wall. These are two different sizes here. They ended up going with the one on the left. Whoops. Here's, uh, you know, some of the colors that we ended up going with. So this says 2015. So it was originally designed for an Italian company, but then that company discipline, they went out of business, I think in 2014. And most of their collection was bought by a Swedish company called Hem. So this is 2015 when Hem had the ownership over the product. And these are the colors that we came up with. You can see these guys here and some of the mounting hardware. So this is 2014. In 2014, I, was, I kind of started playing music again. It was with my girlfriend at the time. We, were, we had this band together, which is kind of a complicated band because it was like I wasn't in the band but I, you know, it's, uh, it was the three women that were in the band, but then I was sort of writing and playing on the record and also recording the record. I'm sort of listed as a producer and just get instrument credits. I guess it's not that complicated. Uh, so in 2014, we made a record um, and it took a long time. It took like a year to write and make and I basically didn't do any design work. It was at once exactly what I needed to do and it was also kind of professionally irresponsible. I wasn't writing people back, you know, and it's like definitely professionally I kind of suffered a little bit. There was like this weird sort of lull for a couple of years, but I'm insanely proud of the record. It, people really liked it and yeah, I don't know. It's very important to me. It's probably one of the things I'm most proud of weirdly. Maybe it's not weird, but it's just, it's not design, but it's what I love to do. 
In, so, so there was a, kind of a lull 2014 and 20, like the first part of 2015, but I did get asked to do this sort of interesting project for a collectible design fair in New York. And there's a company called Artsy that catalogs fine art and sculpture, maybe some design stuff, but they also serve as a marketplace where people can, you can spend $100,000 on a painting if you want, which seems a little crazy to me, just you know, like you're on Amazon or something, but you're buying fine art. So they, well, whatever. So they would do these interventions and they'd invite a designer or an artist to design a site-specific piece for a fair, whether it's Miami or in this case, it was called Collect Collective or something, it was in New York. Uh, and they wanted sort of an outdoor, or not an outdoor, they wanted like a public seating something or whatever. They were very open-ended about it. They had a production budget, which was nice, and it was exactly what I needed because coming off the music thing, I wasn't in this weird, hard industrial design mode. I was, my head was a little bit, um, I was a little bit more scattered, I guess, but in a good way. I just felt more artistic, for lack of a better term. <laughs> Uh, this is the Colosseum, obviously, or a Colosseum. I'm not sure if it's the Colosseum, but um, I thought this was sort of interesting, you know. And I was thinking about the spectacle of these collectible design and art fairs where this over the top sort of public facing stuff with like Kanye and the Kardashians and stuff like that. But then there's also this like kind of really intense like hush hush behind closed doors, like negotiation. And you just, the more you read about the art world, you're like, this is so insane, you know, just like how all this stuff works. Uh, so I wanted to do something that played with like, the sort of public and private uh, spectacle, and I thought this was a good place to start. Um, the production budget wasn't huge, but it was big enough to <coughs> buy a lot of this carpet underlayment, and it's a recycled carpet pad that goes underneath like wall-to-wall -wall carpet, and you can just get huge rolls of it, it's recycled, and then you can just send it back and they'll turn it into more carpet pads. But it had this really nice aggregate kind of stone look. Originally, I drew something like this, and I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. This is just huge, you know, so it, it wasn't, I, I just had this idea. So it was three quarters of a revolution, and basically it's just this profile that's swept, you know, around a central axis, but it has this sort of spectacle uh, amphitheater-like seating on the outside, and then it has this kind of deep recess uh, seating area inside where, when you're in it, when I actually made it, I mean, even though it wasn't the full rotation, it was very, it was really intense because it was like this foam, so it had this acoustic dampening qualities to it, and the wall probably went up seven feet tall, so when you're sitting in there, you felt very protected. This is the, just how it was basically made. I had all these pieces CNC cut, and you know, I called in a favor, and this is back at that set place, and I sat there for like, three or four days just by myself making this thing and you know, basically veneering it in this carpet foam. So it has this sort of monumental look. Here's the piece as it was installed at Collective Design in 2015. Uh, as you can see, I just did a quarter of this revolution, which was good. I mean, it would have been amazing to do the whole thing, but this is the next best thing. Uh, you can see here just a detail and then on the right, like I chose to leave, I mean I've kind of torn between just completely facing the outsides of this, but I just felt like since I imagined it as this full 75% and three quarter revolution, like I wanted to just say that this is sort of a section of it. And then it also spoke to like my work doing, you know, in theater, so this like thin veneer and this kind of illusion and then you step behind the set and it's just this like gnarly scabbed together thing with, you know, drywall screws hanging out of it. And it also just in some way spoke to the whole idea of this coliseum and the performative, or what I perceived as like a performative space at these, you know, art fairs, people parading around and things like that. So uh, it was up for about a week and these are some friends sitting on it. Um, I had a lot of fun with this. It made me want to do more work in this way. Um, then I went back on tour for a while. I was playing with the band Chain the Gang. We played a bunch, went down to Mexico. And I did that for a few months. That was important to me because I just really just want to be playing in a band. Um, okay, we're getting there. Oh my God, there's a lot of slides. Uh, so, uh, 2016, I think, um, I was asked 
a few friends formed this loose collective. And it was based around uh, my friend uh, John Arndt. He was on sabbatical from the University of Oregon. And he spent a year on the east coast of the United States and also in Scandinavia and various parts in uh, Norway and Denmark and in Finland, uh, just doing research about uh, the Shakers, the American Shakers, and then uh, the influence that it had on you know Scandinavian design and just this whatever these sort of connections are. And it's still, I don't think it's really easy to, to define like what was happening, but that was the genesis of his uh, sabbatical. And the output after a year of this was to gather a group of us together to go to Hancock Shaker Village in the western part of Massachusetts, which is maybe three or four hours north of New York City. And it was one of just the kind of biggest and most well-preserved and also well-archived uh, Shaker communities in, in the US. So we worked with the curator and the archivist, both here at Hancock and then also at Mount Lebanon. And we were sort of given an all access whatever. You know, we could just go through the archives, we could touch everything, open the drawers, flip things over. You know, it was really an amazing experience. So this is the actual, well, these are the fields, the round stone barn, and there are probably 15 or 20 different buildings. There's the interior of like the, I think the brothers meeting house or something. If you're not familiar with... Sorry. Yeah. Maybe you, you could tell three sentences about shakers in general. Because oh, okay. It's not so familiar here. Okay. Who uh, knows shakers? Okay. Yeah, well, it was... Oh, a few sentences. Um, so they were, <laughs> I mean, and I am not an expert by any means, but uh, they were a religious offshoot of the Quakers that came with this woman, Mother Anne, who led them from, you know, what is now the UK to America because they were being persecuted for their religious beliefs. So they were an offshoot of that. They're called I'm not actually sure why it was the Shakers. I think that in their sort of religious sort of ceremonies, there was a certain amount of movement that they were, you know, doing. Whether I don't know exactly what it looked like, but um, they were known as the Shakers, and they started in Massachusetts and then slowly spread west. Um, you, they were celibate, so they weren't procreating. So anybody that was invited into the Shaker community had to be you know, just a fully formed person already, which ultimately led to their downfall. I mean, if you can't produce more shakers, you know, it's like you have to make a conscious choice as an adult to want to live in a very sort of austere way. Um, they were sort of, oh man, it's a long discussion, but they were, yeah, so, um, well, just to speak to their, this aesthetic, because this is probably the, you know, the part that is maybe appealing to most people. But they're known for this sort of austere uh, and very restrained aesthetic. Um, it seems so modern and so contemporary. I mean, to believe you know, that this was done, I don't know exactly when, maybe 150 years ago, you may know specifically. But it was, you know, it just blows my mind. I mean, this is as futuristic as anything you'll see anywhere. They were obsessed with cleanliness. They had all these tenants, you know, how they would live their life, and it was very, very prescribed. So like all of, for example, like all of their, you know, they have these peg rails that surround most of their uh, buildings and a lot of the, you know, furniture, whether it's a step stool or whether it's chairs, can all be hung on the wall for, you know, just to make it easy to sweep. All of the uh, chairs are often, if they're on the ground, they're, the height is such that they actually go fully under the table so that, like, you know, dust and stuff, when it settles, it just doesn't settle on the chairs. Uh, you can't see it here, but there's, like, little casters and little wheels on the back of some of these legs to allow you to, like, move the bed out. Um, it's a whole thing, and I suggest for anybody that's interested, just, I mean, there's a ton of books specifically about Shakers, but it is worth your time, and you're going to learn a lot. Um, that was more. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a side of the Shaker barn here. So we were allowed to go through all of their archives, and the thing also about Shakers, it was all very anonymous, you know? It's like, it was just this kind of royal we, or just it was this collective, you know? So most, I would say almost all of the pieces aren't attributed to 
one maker. You can tell sometimes if you're looking at chairs, like certain finials on the top of the chairs, you can be like, oh, that's Mount Lebanon, that's Hancock, that's Sabbath Day Lake. Um, you can tell that way. But a lot of this stuff, it's just like when you'd go to the archives, it would be like wooden boxes and it would just be floor to ceiling, like mind blowing, like, you know, super thin steam bent or just, you know, dry bent, you know, shaker boxes. Uh, the other thing is that they were actually, even though this all sort of looks brown and it's weathered that way, uh, these are some contemporary pieces and they had did this forensic color kind of thing. So actually, in, back in the day when these things were made, I mean, these, the colors and everything, they were just, I mean, it was, it was a whole thing. Um, yeah, so I was inspired by a lot of this stuff. So, I think 10 of us went there and there's designers from Europe and from America and we just sketched things and took photos and some of these are very I mean this is a part of an object but I just like how that looked so for an exhibition that was planned for May of that year in 2015 we all produced some objects so you can see and that's what I was doing <laughs> but uh, I made a series of boxes uh, for fast forward a couple. I kind of saw there was a lot of this stuff happening, like circles intersecting squares. So I kind of got into that, and then that sort of served as this sort of genesis, like these two sort of uh, really primitive forms intersecting each other. And I painted them in sort of shaker appropriate colors, and I made several of them, including a tray. And this is a box here that I think it's supposed to play because it's a video. But uh, these boxes here, they spin, like they have this top that has a pivot on it, so you can sort of access half of it at a time. And I made this painstakingly, made this GIF, and it's very choppy. Uh, so they exhibited that, and then in addition, you know, here's more. It's a shame, yeah, on the bottom of this leg here, there's a caster, this little wooden caster. Um, squares and circles, these are setup blocks that are typically used in machine shops. It's, I think, they all have different names. This is like one by three by five, and it's like, you know, one inches, three inches, five inches. I'm sure there's met metric equivalents, and they're all threaded. They're really ingenious, like really beautiful shapes. Uh, so I designed some candle holders. These were the first ones that I just machined in wood. Uh, the shakers are also very, very thrifty. Um, you could just tell by like they would re recycle rags and turn them into rugs. So the idea with this, besides the formal circle and square thing, this was, you know, an ode to sort of their thriftiness. So you know, if you have like a drawer with all the weird odd and end candles, you have like a Hanukkah candle, and then like a big candle, and then a tea light, and then a little birthday candle. So there's just four holes on each side of this block, similar to that setup block, that are just based on standard candle sizes. So you can just flip them over and make some sort of composition and use whatever the odds and ends uh, candles that you have. Um, for the show, I had them machined in aluminum. Uh, this is a photo that I took. And now they're made by that same company, Matter. They make them in brass and aluminum and also in stone. Almost there. OK. Uh, same year, I was asked to do a shaving brush for a company called Harry's. And I wanted to sort of reimagine this. I didn't like, uh, I don't know. I was like, this can be done different. So there are these toys, these like weeble wobble toys that you know always write themselves. And I found this uh, little diagram, and I finally used some of like the really in-depth features in SolidWorks to figure out mass properties and how things should balance, where this is the center of gravity, you know, and when it sways to the left of this blue line, it wants to immediately go back to this point here. So it'll always write itself, and you have to figure out how much you know, mass you're going to put here versus the overall size. So to mock this up, I made this as a phone video. Uh, it's like the bottom, it was like right after Easter. I was kind of down to the wire. The show was in May, so I just took the bottom of like a plastic Easter egg and stuffed it full of pennies. Again, this is like the whole like prototyping workshop thing. It's like whatever it takes, you know? It's like I could have like sat there with my eyes crossed looking at the computer, but it's faster to go to like the, you know, the pharmacy, get this egg and like stuff it full of pennies and like plasticine and figure out if it would work. So I don't know why it's so choppy. But anyway, it's kind of the proof of concept. I was like, oh, it's going to work. You know, it's not great, but it, 
it's playing here, I don't know, strange. Uh, so that happened, and then here's the actual piece. I didn't have, a, there wasn't a large, there wasn't a lot of room for error since the show was right around the corner. I couldn't have it machined, so I just had to be 100% sure that it was gonna write because I, be right because I had to have this 3D printed in steel. And hopefully this will play, maybe. I made this video at home and I don't know why it's choppy. Anyway, eh, it just kind of goes. I'm just gonna see what happens if I hit play again. Maybe it'll be smoother. Maybe that's 2017, I don't know. Maybe I made the video in 27. I'm pretty sure it was 2015. Still choppy, okay. Well, that happened. Um, and then I made a record with my friend, uh, Ava. This is my basement, I did a recording studio in the basement. And she's amazing. She put out a record under the name Sneaks. Um, so this is pretty recent. So around 2017, there was an, an, uh, an initiative between the, like the French embassy and, uh, I think it was the French embassy, it was like the, the consulate or something like that. And they were pairing American designers with sort of research institutes, some sort of manufacturing in France, and in France with the idea being that there would be an exhibition in New York during Design Week to celebrate this French-American design partnership. Um, I was selected, just I'm not sure how exactly it happened, but they called me and asked me if I wanted to go to Marseille in the south of France to work at Serva. And what started as just this kind of one-off thing, you know, that this five-day long thing has turned into a residency that's been going on now for about four years. Um, they're really interesting. It's a glass research institute. So they invite non-glass artists and designers to come there and basically work with the technicians just to realize your vision, I guess. They'll, they say yes to everything. In my professional career, people are constantly telling me no. You know, you want it bigger, no. And so you want it green, they're like, no. And then, but here, it's like they'll do anything you want. You're like, break it. And they're like, okay. And then you're like, make it bigger. And they're like, do it. And make it, you know, so it was amazing working there. Um, the first five, you know, the first like five day short residency, I was there. On the first day, the director, Isabel, said, you know, Jonah, this is not long enough. You know, you have to come back. Because when you're there, you blow glass the first day and you put it into a kiln and it anneals the glass. And it has to bring it slowly from like a thousand degrees down to room temperature. And that takes 12 or 16 hours. So what you blow on the first day, you can't even see it till the second day. So five days is nothing. All of a sudden it's just like your time, you know, you trying to improve and sort of build upon what you did the previous day is very, very difficult because you have to think so fast. Uh, so she invited me back for um, once in 2017 and then I was there uh, this past uh, summer. These are the facilities here. There's four technicians. There's a small flat like on the third floor and you can stay there. They pay for your materials. They put you up and pay for you to get there. And they've been doing it for about maybe 40 years at this point. And it's, you know, every designer's from, you know, Jasper Morrison or uh, Gaetano Pesce or something to, to like a million other people that are as good that you've never heard of, you know, that are from wherever, different places. Um, these are the facilities and it was really amazing. So here's uh, the, I butcher it, but Unité de Habitation in Marseille. And it's a Corbusier, sort of utopian, <laughs> Thing. I mean, Adam, you probably heard, know more, but yeah, it's like there's retail, there's living, there's like a pool up on top, there's I think a church, it's just this kind of self-contained vision for how people should live. But it's all uh, made in this sort of cast concrete or beton brut where it's board form, so you get this crazy texture in the, uh, in the glass. So when I was there the first time, it was very like, I felt like there's this big divide between the glass blowers and myself. Um, they work, it's like a well-oiled machine if you've seen anybody blow glass. I mean, they know, they have like eyes on the back of their head, they know where everybody is and it's this very, really choreographed routine when they're making things. And I felt very much like an outsider and obviously I'm not going to become an expert glass blower or become 
you know, part of their inner circle, but I wanted to get involved and I wanted to like get my hands dirty. Again, I was just like, I don't want to look at the computer anymore. So, you know, drawing sort of inspiration from those textures and this kind of molded, um, that board form concrete, I started making these improvised molds. And at first they were just, these are just scrap junk objects. It's like a piece of, you know, like an iron cube and some bricks. And, you know, I was trying to make these kind of improvised molds, I guess, that would impart a texture on the exterior of the glass. And they would, with the idea being that they would blow glass into it, the glass would fill the negative space, and then this mold would get dismantled and one mold would yield one glass vessel. Since they're all different, you'd have these sort of unique pieces. This is one of the first ones I did, you know, and obviously if you blow glass in there, it's like, you think about like blowing, like you're like, that's not a very strong feeling, but when they blow into the glass, there's so much pressure, like it's surprising. I was like, oh, I'll just be able to like sit there and hold it. But it's like, as soon as they start blowing in there, I mean, the mold just exploded and just went everywhere. So I got into these more elaborate molds. And again, these are just like, it's just scrap material, you know, concrete blocks and things like that. And just started experimenting with uh, different ways to make these molds. And these molds here would take, I don't know, two hours to make, two and a half hours. You know, there's no, almost nothing square. So you're just, you have these clamps that are just on the corners of bricks that are crumbling. And uh, it was very trying because it was a very high failure rate. This video, I hope this one works. It's a good one. Come on. This is going to be frustrating to watch. I'm sorry guys, this is pretty painful, but you get the idea. So there's me making the molds painfully. So they sort of get the glass on the end of the punty or whatever it's called. So while I'm making the molds, you know, sitting there for maybe two hours, then at some point they start kind of getting, gathering the glass. And I did some that had this texture kind of confetti look to it. And here they blow it in. To get the glass in there, some of these pieces had to be removable. So we would just sit there and hold this thing together and rip it apart and you'd end up with something like that. And here's the furnace. So you'd have to put it into the furnace and then you couldn't look at it for like 16 hours. So these are some of the pieces. I mean, glass is an amazing thing. If you've never worked with it, it is just the coolest material. Supposedly it's not a liquid or a solid. It, ex it exists like somewhere in between and it's always sort of weirdly in flux and in tension. And the colors are wild too. I think this one ended up being, I mean, it looks reddish blue, but I don't know. I think, I don't know, this could have ended up yellow. There's just like this whole chemical process. It's like glazing ceramics, you know, you put it on one color, take it out of the kiln, it's something else. Like I said, these molds were a real pain to make and there was a super high failure rate. I probably only got two pieces, you know, that were sort of salvageable. It was really heartbreaking. Um, but the director, she was really supportive and she sort of believed in what I was trying to do and invited, you know, she was like, we're just gonna have to like have you back here to do something. So personal stuff, I love my bike more than anything. This is my bike. I travel with it every, like it, when I can, I bring it wherever I go. This is riding around in Norway. Um, my bike, it's just really important to me. Like, I feel like as I've gotten older, you know, I'm constantly in the, like a low key existential crises about like, what am I doing? Am I doing a good job? You know, do I really need to make another chair like this thing? You're constantly like, all of this stuff is in your head. And with my bike, it's the best thing ever because there's like a front and a back and unless, you know, and you're typically only moving in one direction and you leave your house. And if you get back to your house, it's like, you did everything right. There's like no room for like interpretation or debate. So for me, it's like the most meditative thing. Like if I'm having like a hard day or just like in a bad place, I just get on my bike and then ride for like three hours or whatever, and then get back to where I started. And then I can sort of take a deep breath. It also feels pretty good. So this is in Norway. Uh, so from Norway, the reason I was there is because my friend Halger on the right, he's based in Oslo. And if anyone was here for the workshop, you, this next like seven or eight slides is gonna be re repetitive, but I'll try to 
embellish it. Uh, he and I have been friends for a long time, maybe about 10 years at this point. I met him in Milan. Uh, we started sharing an Airbnb together. Uh, he's just my, my buddy. I don't know. We've just been good friends. We, you know, we have similar, we have similar taste and our temperament's very compatible. He works by himself in Oslo and I work by myself and the partnership started with my desire to work with Scandinavian companies, which, you know, can tend to be, not so much anymore, but can tend to be a little bit insular. And then working with American companies, which can also in their own way tend to be a little bit insular. Uh, so we would team up and pitch ideas to Scandinavian companies and pitch ideas to um, American companies. We've done a little bit of both. We've done work with a Danish company, a Norwegian company, and two American companies so far. Uh, this is us in Denmark. Uh, so this is quickly just going through a chair that we worked on uh, for the company Design Within Reach. This came out uh, a year ago, so we're almost in the present. Um, and yeah, so the Super Legera chair, is that? I, I think that's how you pronounce it. And this is Fred Sandbeck, and he's like probably one of my favorite um, artists, you know, contemporary of Judd, and does these amazing uh, sort of work. They look like kind of three-dimensional line drawings made out of uh, wool uh, twine that's like a stretched, you know, between planes in the gallery space. Uh, they wanted an angular chair, so this is part of our mood board that we put together. Uh, we collaborate really closely, and what we do, it would have been impossible 10 years ago. We work, you know, through Dropbox and WhatsApp and a variety of productivity apps to collaborate together. Uh, the hardest thing being the six or seven hour time difference, depending on daylight savings time in the U.S. Um, these are just from sketches. You know, I'll send him sketches, he'll scan it, and he'll draw on top of it, and then I'll draw on top of what he did. And slowly we got to something that resembled the chair that was produced. I don't know, something's supposed to be here, but it's not. Uh, these are just some early sort of scale models. You know, we tried to stay off the computer as best we could, which is difficult these days. When we finally went to the computer, um, you know, we were able to loft a lot of these uh, shapes for the back and for the seat. Uh, it was going to be an upholstered chair so that there was a three, three to, yeah, there was a molded plywood seat pan and then a molded plywood back that were then upholstered to figure out what those would feel like. You know, we modeled it approximately based on some other chairs that were, you know, sort of in that world in terms of, you know, where the lumbar, lumbar support should be and uh, how deep the curve and on uh, the seat is and the angles and how they relate to each other. And we were able to basically just slice it. This is one inch foam, 25 or whatever, and basically just sliced the 3D model at one inch intervals and, you know, made it, mirrored it obviously in the middle of the chair. And I sat there in my attic and just cut these all and glued them all together and assembled it onto this medieval kind of frame looking thing. So, you know, you, we just learned a ton from this thing here. You know, I just screwed all this together. Um, and you could sort of modify it as you see fit, like this T-shaped thing that's actually like a component for, a, that's like a part of a model for a candle holder I made. And I needed to get like a little bit more angle there. So I loosened the screws and jammed that in there. You know, I had some random foam and I'd sit there and, you know, sand down the back to get the kind of contour just right. This chain thing here, which I'm proud of, was a way to like adjust the angle of the back. You could just hop it down like one link at a time by pulling this drywall screw. And that was very informative and it led to something that was a little bit more, that had sort of a, you know, we were a little bit more, or we were definitely more confident about what we were doing. Uh, we sent full scale drawings out to a couple of factories. Uh, well, this is all through Design Within Reach. They had factories in, uh, in in Thailand and also one in Italy. Uh, this is me reviewing the samples. One of the hard things about collaborating is that him being in Oslo, it's, you know, unless the timing is just right where we can be in the same room at the same time, you know, I had to go up to Stamford, Connecticut, just north of New York to review the samples and he was just sitting on the computer like Skyping in and I was flipping this thing upside down and showing him what was happening. Um, you know, just making sure that things were just right. The two factories, they were pretty, I mean, they produced samples, it was all on spec. 
and the two chairs, it was really hard to tell what was going on. Neither of them were quite, were quite right. Some of the, the legs were right, but then the tilt was wrong and some of the curves were wrong. And I was sitting there trying to compare and figure out like what was happening on each of these chairs. And while I tried this very scientific approach, it didn't yield much. So as I showed this earlier today, this is a quick like uh, animated GIF comparing the two chairs. I made several of these from the front and like a kind of perspective view, but you know, just kind of anchoring the chairs, like the back legs in the same place, and then seeing just what's happening. You know, I mean, it's very unscientific, but it kind of revealed a lot of the difference between the two chairs when you're trying to imagine this, these curves and these angles moving in 3D space. You know, there's a molded plywood piece on the back. You can see on one of the chairs, it's much flatter. One of these chairs has a much deeper curve. This changes here, the seat height changes, legs move in and out. So that was helpful to understand what was happening. Uh, based on this, decided to go with the company in Bangkok or outside of Bangkok. Uh, one of the best things about what I do is I get to hang out with people I like in other places that I also like. So we went to Thailand and went to, on a factory visit which was really amazing. We spent four days there just with the, this crew of craftspeople. Uh, just, you know, they would make a chair, we'd cut it up and screw it back together just to get everything just, just right. You can see here, this has been cut and screwed and glued back together several times. This is more factory stuff and here's the finished chair. Here's a better picture. Well, that's the front. Uh, these are the uh, counter height and uh, bar stool height. If you're not familiar with Design Within Reach, they're like a huge retailer of modern design in the United States. For a long time, they sold the classics, Herman Miller, Knoll. They started branching out to like Muto and things like that um, in the last 10 years. And then more recently, in the last five or so years, they've um, started producing or working with factories to produce their own designs. So. I don't know, having work in the Design Within Reach catalog, it was one of those things where it's like my mom was like so happy, you know, or like friends' moms would call me or something. I was like, this is weird, uh, you know, from high school. Oh my God, I saw the chair. So this, it was just, I don't know. It was another chair, but it was also, it meant a lot to me uh, quickly. So I started teaching in like 2018. Um, I was invited to be a visiting artist at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Here's just a couple of things. Uh, I did an exercise about sand tools and had all the students out on the beach and they were making different tools to mold sand. Uh, this is a fourth year student who did this crazy optical thing with all these magnetically repositionable lenses and prisms on this panel that would hang on the wall. And here's a couple pieces from last spring. Um, it was an undergraduate and graduate class where they were designing around the theme of obsolescence. So this is a, a foot-powered desk lamp, and this is a lamp that's made out of coal. And it was an animated GIF, but it's not working. <coughs> We're almost there. All right, here I made another record that came out in March of 2019, and I, it's me playing guitar. Um, I think this is the end here, but in 2019, in July, or no, in June of this year, I went back to Marseille to finish this work at Serva, which is not quite done. Um, I was there for two weeks, I think, and I had a much better idea of sort of what I wanted to do, and it involved using the same types of materials, these ceramic bricks and shelf material, uh, but having them sort of pre-cut with a certain, like a, I think it was like a 10 by 10, you know, underlying grid. It's sort of like Minecraft, you know, like that type of thing, like this almost pixelated uh, approach. Uh, and this was a big inspiration, this sort of very regular uh, pattern on the underside of the uh, building in Marseille. So you can see like, here is the molds as they are now, and it's much more regular. I was able to find uh, materials of varying thicknesses that related to each other. So I think these were like maybe 10, and these were 20, and then these other bricks were 60, and they were cut in such a way that you could stack them in different orientations. So whereas the original molds took maybe two hours to make, I could make one of these in about 40 minutes. And the texture was a lot more pleasing to me. Uh, this is one of the guys cutting it. Uh, here's some of the vases as they are now, and some of them are uncut still. But 
I ended up, I don't know, I mean the failure rate was much, much lower. There's still a learning curve because if you're a glass blower and you're blowing the same vase over and over again, the first bunch of them are going to be pretty screwed up until you know how hot the glass needs to be, how much glass you need, how much you blow into it, how long you leave it in the mold. They get better and better at that stuff. But with these ones, even though the mold was easier to make and in some ways more reliable, each mold was different. So they don't know, you know, the amount of glass, the amount of time, the amount of force that they need to blow into it was always changing. So while these were, it was much easier to get something usable, there was still probably maybe 20 or 30% uh, failure rate. Uh, here they are cut. And this is just one of them. So you could see the texture was a lot more reliable in having these 10 millimeter wide uh, pieces of kiln shelf allowed for this. I don't know, it seemed that the scale made a lot more sense with the size of the vessel before the, everything was like too chunky and it didn't have the, there's sort of a disconnect between the size of the vessel and the uh, resolution or something. Um, this is me this summer riding my bike and this is just like a few weeks ago. This is my dad. So he's still doing his thing. He's an eccentric kind of architect and he lives in the back of this temple and he spends most of his days doing these huge drawings and they're all like pen and ink and colored pencil. They're probably like a, I don't know, the big one. And yeah, he's st still inspiring me. And that was the end. Okay. <laughs>